Hello, welcome to our presentation on declarative clients in Spring. My name is Olga Maciaszek Szalma. I'm a software engineer in Spring Cloud team. I mostly work on Spring Cloud Load Balancer, Spring Cloud Open Fane, Spring Cloud Netflix, and Spring Cloud Contract, and also on AOT transformations and native image integration for Spring Cloud projects. And my name is Rosen Stojanchev. I am a member of the Spring Framework team, as well as the Spring GraphQL team. I'm involved in Spring MVC, WebFlux, Web Messaging, RSocket. Let's start with this basic question. What is a declarative client? Let's imagine a simple scenario where we have two applications that are communicating. So we have a customer service where we can register our customers, but we do not fully trust all the customers. We think some of them might be frauds. So before registering them, we are going to verify them in a verification service and check if they're legit. In order to do this, we will be sending post HTTP requests at verify endpoint, and then we will be uh, expecting to receive a response in a customer verification result object. There are many ways in which we could do this, and arguably some are better and some are worse. The simplest, uh, but probably not the best way, is in our service class just to have some kind of client that is injected, for example, a REST template. We set it up, passing our headers, passing uh, the URI, and then we do the call in that class and we directly handle the result in the same class. As you could have seen, that is not a very good way of doing this because uh, we get too many lower level implementation details in that service class. And also we are not able to reuse these methods and we have in general, not very clean call. So we could improve it a bit by extracting uh, an interface and have one interface for the communication with that verification service where uh, we would have signatures for all the communication methods, because we can imagine that we are going to have other methods that we are going to call. So other HTTP requests that we want to execute against that verification service application. And then uh, we can also have known parameters, known return types, and we are going to be able to reuse these methods. So we can declare this interface. And then obviously we need to provide an implementation. And the great thing that the interface gives us is that we could have various implementations. For example, in one, we could use REST template and then in another implementation that we could run, let's say on a different environment, we could be using web client. And then we can also hide all the details of the actual setup for our HTTP calls. As you can see, we are doing this here. And this also allows us to add some kind of helper methods that we can reuse for different calls. Very often, if we are communicating uh, with certain similar applications or the same service, we will have very similar setup that we want to reuse. And in this way, we just have to implement this once and use it later. Obviously, we now need to call this method in some way. So the rest of this uh, register method looks the same as what we've seen in the previous slides. And just instead of directly making calls with REST template, we are now using the injected verification service client and calling this verify method, we are able to pass our parameters. And what if we didn't have to write this implementation. So let's imagine that we could just create an annotated interface and then have some library or a framework translated into an actual HTTP uh, request. So we would just create our interface with the method signatures that we need, annotate them 
with annotations that we could imagine would be somehow similar to the one that we use uh, for controllers, for example, request body or uh, request param, etc. And then a library or framework would create some kind of proxy that would translate this into actual HTTP calls. As many of you know, such kind of solutions already exist. One vastly popular solution of this kind is Fane. Here you can see a snippet with a Fane request. So this is an interface and these are the annotations that are used in Fane core, which is a separate project. We have request line and we have the param annotations. And this is what you would be using if you wanted to use core Fane in the open Fane project. This is a project that used to be part of Spring Cloud Netflix module, but then it was passed over to the community that is maintaining it. It is a Java to HTTP client binder. It supports various HTTP clients underneath, including Apache HTTP, Apache HC5, OK HTTP, and it has this super useful concept of contracts that allows uh, library developers and other developers to provide support for custom annotations and for argument resolution also in a custom way. It does also support a broad range of encoders and decoders, including for Jackson and JSON. It supports metrics, including micrometer support. And you can use this project on its own with the annotations that I've just shown you. But you could also use our Spring Cloud Open Fane project, which is a Spring Cloud project built around the core Fane project. And what it does is take this Fane mechanism and make it more user friendly for Spring Boot and Spring Cloud users. So what we do is use the contract provided by Fane to provide a Spring MVC annotation supports. You can use the same MVC annotations that you use in your controllers, uh, such as get mapping, for example, and such as request body and so on. And you can virtually just copy what you have in your controller, paste it over to the interface, remove the bodies of the methods to just stay with the signatures, and it works. That's why it has a very flat learning curve for any developer that works with Spring MVC. We also provide auto configurations for Fane specific bins. So you just need to add a starter. You do not need to create them on your own. And we provide integration for Spring Cloud projects. For example, Spring Cloud Load Balancer, Spring Cloud Circuit Breaker, underneath Service Discovery Client, of course. And we also provide tracing support. And this is what a Spring Cloud Open Fane interface looks like. So as you see, we are now using post mapping uh, annotation instead of the one that we had before. Also the method parameter annotations have changed. We have, for example, the request header annotation, and we have this Fane client annotation on top with a service ID. And this service ID will be used for load balancing under the hood. And then we obviously have to call this as you can see, nothing much changes. We just change the annotations on our interface, and then we call it in pretty much the same way. Spring Cloud Open Fane is a highly popular project. It has more than 900 GitHub stars. You can see the number of Maven downloads here. That's just for 2021. And it is because, as we've seen, it has this nearly flat learning curve for Spring MVC users. However, it also has various issues. Specifically, um, the decision to allow putting request mapping at class level for the open Fane interfaces has caused various problems. And we have been discouraging it for some time because there were issues related to it. And finally, we had to remove it when there was a CVE file. Also, there are some maintenance issues caused by the fact that the core component is maintained by a third party. And we often need to wait for an issue to be resolved by them in order for us to be able to fix something. However, even with 
those issues, we would probably just continue recommending Spring Cloud Open Fane as a declarative client of choice for Spring and uh, Spring Cloud users. However, the main issue that we faced with it um, for some time now is the lack of non-blocking support. We were not able to provide non-blocking support for it because it would require re-architecting core components that are in the third-party core library. That is why we wanted to provide a different solution and we have offered one based on square components, so retrofit mainly, because unlike OpenFane, we were able to provide web client support under the hood for retrofit interface clients uh, without having to re-architect the solution in any major ways. So for that, we provide auto configurations for retrofit um, declarative clients. We again provide integrations with Spring Cloud projects such as load balancing, tracing, and Unlike in Spring Cloud Open Fane, we only allow retrofit annotations, not Spring MVC annotations. And this is an incubator project. This project has currently 0.4.1 version, and we are not going to be moving it out of incubator because of the new solution that we will talk about in a moment. However, we are going to be maintaining it as long as Spring Cloud 2021 is maintained, and this is the preferred non-blocking declarative client for uh, Spring Cloud 2021. That is not everything that has been happening in declarative or interface client space. There have been also attempts to provide a solution for our socket. For example, our colleague Josh Long has created the retro socket project that does just that. And this is also an incubator project. And that's where we come to the part about Spring Framework 6 and the solution that uh, we have in place. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about those interface clients um, in the Spring Framework. Um, the interface clients, having interface clients in the Spring Framework is not anything new. Uh, we've had similar uh, base mechanism for other protocols like Hessian, HTTP Invoker, uh, JMS Invoker, fundamentally it involves uh, creating a proxy uh, based on an interface. So the application provides an interface and the framework fills in at runtime on startup with the proxy and the proxy does all the work um, for the implementation of that interface. Um, and what you'll see here is an issue actually for many of those uh, being dropped out, um, dropped off in Spring Framework 6. Um, because they're no longer needed, but it's a mechanism uh, that's been there for a while, um, and we're now refreshing it and replacing it with new options um, for HTTP and, and R socket. Um, we also had an existing request uh, for an R socket interface client. That's something that um, was present in our um, issue tracker uh, for a little bit. A little while uh, when we started talk, talking to uh, the Spring Cloud team. And there were similar requests for an HTTP interface client as well. Th this is an older one. Um, it goes back a few years. Um, and we did not do it because we decided to defer to Spring Cloud OpenFane, which already had a solution in that space where this type of technology seemed to be um, in use and, and quite popular. Um, so there was a solution in place and we um, basically uh, did not do anything at the time and closed that issue. Um, and that's where um, came in those conversations with the Spring Cloud team and the plans to um, update their HTTP um, and um, socket interface client options uh, to provide blocking and non-blocking um, just generally to modernize um, and to improve and to make them more flexible. Um, and we decided that there's an opportunity to revisit uh, because if you think about it, the underlying mechanism is not specific to Spring Cloud. Um, it's something that is more general as a component and as a mechanism. And um, all that Spring Cloud really needs to do is um, add some extensions on top um, that are uh, specific to cloud-related functionality. Uh, but other than that, uh, the 
uh, mechanism of making an interface client um, is just that. It's just um, lower level infrastructure that uh, they would be just as okay with having in place um, and provide it for them. So we decided to explore this route and find out uh, what we could do uh, since we hadn't really done it before uh, for HTTP. And um, the first question uh, that came out of that is, what should the programming model look like? Um, are we going to really take the request mapping annotation as we know it, um, and, and as Olga pointed out, which makes it very familiar? Is that, however, the right approach if we were to start over um, and take a fresh look at this? So there's a couple of things um, that became obvious very quickly is that if we want to have an HTTP interface client, um, one specific thing which is in contrast to what we're used to doing with Spring MVC on the server side is that um, instead of mapping a request, we want to define a single request. You want to uh, define a concrete request that needs to be sent um, from the client to the server. Um, and also we want to make sure that anything which is very much kind of leaking through a, a server contract or something that's very much tied to a uh, server programming model um, is not something that um, really comes through because it doesn't fit um, when you talk about making client calls. So um, again, the request mapping annotation, uh, we use that on the server side in order to map requests from the server uh, coming into the server. Uh, we're going to make sure that one controller method can handle uh, really up to um, any any number of requests. You can see here kind of defined in a very general way. We have a request mapping, which means that it's any HTTP method. It can be get or post or put. And the URL pattern there is a double star, which means any path at any depth um, Obviously, typically, that's not exactly how most mappings look like, but it's just to demonstrate the point that we can make it really, really broad um, and map to any number of requests uh, if we wanted to. Now, this isn't something that's going to work well for declaring a request, because when you declare a request, you want to be very specific. Which HTTP method should that be? And what URL should be selected? We need to be in the mode of of actually declaring a very concrete instance um, of an endpoint invocation. So with that in mind, um, let's take a look also at the inputs and the outputs. Um, an app request mapping method, um, when we look at most of the parameters, um, like HTTP method, request headers, parameters, uh, the request body, request attributes, um, those seem to fit quite well, whether you use them on the client side or on the server side. You want to uh, define a header, um, and that works for a client, and that also works for um, the server side. Request parameters, um, we can talk about the query string, query parameters, or uh, we can even tie that to the body for form data. Uh, request body, HTTP method, all of those things we do need to select. And uh, those annotations seem to work just fine um, when we took a closer look in terms of the attributes that they provide and how they might be used um, in a client, on a client side as well. However, uh, there are certainly some other arguments like, for example, server request is an obvious one that you don't really um, have anything to do with that on the client side. That's obviously a server side um, type. Um, likewise, um, there is no model in view rendering from a client side perspective. That's server side rendering. And um, there's no place really for a model attribute or a model when we're declaring a request. That's, that's more of a server side programming model uh, construct. Uh, we can see the same thing uh, with return values. Um, generally speaking, uh, the response is uh, response status, headers, and body. And um, all variations that represent that information, like a response entity, HTTP headers, these types uh, work well, a response body. But if you talk about things like model, uh, view, um, SSE emitter, these are, again, 
constructs for server-side programming model that um, are going to help to prepare a response, uh, but they're not really essential to uh, declaring a request. So what this means is that we actually um, can reuse many of the um, uh, constructs that make up a request mapping method, but we can't reuse the request mapping annotation itself because that's um, uh, too broad. It's not. It's meant for mapping. It's not for declaring a request. Um, so we decided to create a new annotation called HTTP Exchange uh, that we can use for declaring um, rather than mapping a request, and that um, annotation can um, have these kinds of attributes, uh, like a URL, method, content type, um, accept, um, in order to define what URL are we going to, what HTTP method are we going to use, and what kind of media types are going to define the request, the content body, uh, the body of the request, the um, what kind of media types we expect for the response, and so on. Now, the method parameters that are supported as part of that um, is going to be analogous to app request mapping, uh, but we're going to look at only a subset of that uh, because only a subset of the uh, parameters fit. Uh, but that's good. Um, that, that, that's fine uh, because we can have some continuity and familiarity and reuse what actually can be reused um, and continue to feel familiar. Uh, but with the right method level annotation um, to give it um, uh, the right semantics. The, um, so these are the um, these are all examples of different uh, parameters uh, that are possible uh, to use. Uh, it's just uh, some of them, not all of them. Um, and in terms of the return values, again, it's only a subset um, and those that are not uh, tied to the server side programming model. Um, so this um, provides an example of what it looks like. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very nice experience um, using this client, uh, to be honest. Uh, when we uh, first got to the part of writing the tests, um, it was actually quite exciting to <laughs> how easy it is to just write this interface and then start testing and making, making calls. And to think that that's um, actually do all the work of making the HTTP calls, that was quite a nice experience already. Um, and it, it comes with built-in flexibility, um, as you would expect from, from these annotated methods. Um, so in this case, for example, we're returning a verification result object. Um, we're passing a request body, and the annotation um, on the method tells us uh, what URL uh, we're going to uh, go to. Um, of course, the underlying client, which is um, this is connected to, and we'll see how that's done in a moment, um, is going to have some sort of a base URL that's predefined for the entire, um, uh, for all of these um, client methods, uh, so that we don't have to repeat that on every um, annotation. But of course, we could also have a type level um, HTTP exchange annotation if we wanted to combine um, type level and method level attributes. Um, this is an example of where it's blocking um, and um, that's what's nice about this, again, is that it's flexible and we can uh, simply, as a framework, we can simply adapt to the uh, return type that we see on this client and do the right thing. Um, this is an example with getting headers and body and status with response entity and all the combinations here, mono response entity, all of that is supported. HTTP headers, if you only want the headers, or it can be just a void method if you um, just want to, you know, make the call um, and there isn't really anything data to be uh, obtained. And in order to actually um, make this uh, work, um, you need to create an HTTP service proxy factory um, and that takes a web client builder as input. Um, well, in fact, um, it's actually decoupled from um, whether it's the web client or not, uh, but that's the main implementation that we have at the moment. Um, there is a um, web client adapter um, that 
will wrap the web client in order to plug it into this HTTP service proxy factory. Um, and this proxy factory is the thing that once you create that, you can give it these kinds of interfaces and that will generate a proxy, will create a proxy for you uh, that you can start using. Um, so um, obviously the, this um, gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, you can define multiple web clients if you want like this. Uh, different web clients um, with different base URLs for different posts, target posts. Um, and then um, you can declare it as a bean or you can inject it if you just need it somewhere locally and then use that to uh, create the, the proxy factory. And once you have a proxy factory, you can reuse that over and over again in order to uh, create uh, these kinds of proxies. And once we um, uh, worked out this whole pattern with HTTP, uh, then we also went back and did the same for our socket, um, uh, which is actually straightforward because the number of arguments um, is even smaller uh, than with HTTP. Uh, it's basically um, destination variables, which can be embedded um, in the route for an R socket request. Um, you have uh, payload. Um, which is essentially the body of the request, um, as, as you would in HTTP. Um, and in our socket, there's also metadata, which is basically like headers in HTTP. Um, and you can uh, have that declared as a metadata object um, that would typically be followed by the mind type. And the mind type would express what kind of metadata, uh, how is the metadata encoded. Um, and, and that allows us to uh, then decode the metadata. <clears throat> accordingly. And that's um, pretty much it for what we have. That's um, how it looks. An R socket exchange method, very similar to HTTP. Um, it's the same ideas, just slightly different um, inputs and outputs. Now let's see some code in action. Here we have our verification client, like we have seen on the slides. So we are going to be doing a post and we are using the post exchange annotation and we are passing our path in the URL attribute. And we are also going to be passing a body that is a customer application object, just a simple DTO, to be honest. And we will want to be calling this method from this class. So. Here, as we can see, we have our injected verification client. We will call verify, we will receive some result, and we will uh, process it based on this. So if the result is correct, we are going to say accept it. And if not, we are going to recheck this and some further demo processing is going to be taking place. So as Rosen has said, we are going to need to create this verification client, but do not worry, it is super simple. You basically need this uh, service proxy factory object. And in order to create it, we'll need a web client because as you can see, we have an adapter layer and underneath the adapter layer, we are passing a web client object. So I'm going to use a builder. And I'm going to do one more thing, which is to show you how easy it is to integrate it with a Spring Cloud, for example. I have added a Spring Cloud starter load balancer, and I am going to inject here a load balanced exchange filter function. And what I need to do is to just pass it uh, with the filter. And here, instead of a normal looking URL, I'm passing HTTP, so the protocol could be HTTPS, followed by the service ID. And the service ID will be used to retrieve the right instance of the service that we are communicating with. Usually would use some kind of service registry. Here for demo, I'm just using simple discovery client and I'm specifying the instances in properties. So uh, I have both the apps running, the customer service and the verification service. I have a tiny JSON representing the person that we are verifying, and we can just do some calls. They will enter uh, here through register. Then this will take us to the method call. And we call verify, 
And then in our verification service, it enters here. So as you can see, the exchange has been done. We only have created this client interface with certain annotations and then created our beans as we usually would. And all the HTTP calls and the load balancing are being executed for us under the hood. So as you can see, it's very simple to use it in practice. And that is actually all we have for today. Thank you very much for staying with us. And we have linked a lot of resources that you can use to learn more about these solutions, read the docs, and also check all the samples, both for HTTP client and for RSocket client. Thank you.